The SMBC Windsteppers have begun their 2024 outdoor season. They practice on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Any athlete age 4 to 18 can join the team. If you would like to support the team with facilities, travel, and membership fees, you can purchase a Casey's Community Card. Cards are only $20. Each card enables you to get a free medium single topping pizza each time you order a large specialty pizza. If you buy one pizza, get one free. Cards can be purchased from any Windstepper athlete, or you can order from Coach John or Coach Autumn. The Windsteppers thank you for your support. Save the date, Saturday, June 8th, for our ladies' tea. Come laugh with me. Hosted by Daughters of Destiny at Second Missionary Baptist Church, 5111 Harry Truman Drive, Grandview, Missouri. Grab your hat and gloves and join the fellowship, sharing the love. Registration will start April 7th. More information to come, please contact Sister Wiki Powell at 816-210-8170 for more information. Stay connected with Second Missionary Baptist Church. Be sure and sign up with Remind to get text messages with updates about events and service. Find us on social media and like, comment, share, and subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Scan a QR code for anything else you may need to stay connected with your SMBC family. This has been your SMBC News for today. New announcement requests must be submitted two weeks prior to your desired airing date. All new requests are to be submitted to Sister Mildred Cofield. Thank you for watching your SMBC News. Good evening. God bless you. Welcome out to another Wednesday night in the Word. Well, we are thankful. We are grateful. We are excited to be able to come to your hearts and to your home to share uh, Word of God with you as we continue our journey in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I mean, apologize, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we tackled verses 10 through 15 at the closing of Bible study on last week, talking about the church as a building. Tonight, we're going to start off with, or start off with the remaining of chapter 3, looking at verses 16 through uh, 23, we're thankful to have Deacon Walker to co-labor with us today and Sister Guido being our reader. And so we actually do let your fingers do the walking to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through verses 23. And as your fingers are doing the walking, we're going to ask that Deacon Walker would open us up with prayer. And after the prayer, we ask that Sister Guido would uh, read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 23. Let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, most gracious God, we come to you now as humbly as we know how. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. And we ask, Lord, that you would forgive our sins and our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Lord, you are so gracious to us. Your love is never ending. Your patience with us is infinite. So, Lord, we just ask right now that you will continue to pour blessings upon us, that you will continue to strengthen us and walk with us. We ask that you would bless all those that are on this call and all those that are, are joining later. Lord, we ask that you will look in on those that are sick and shut in, that you will touch those that are in need of a healing, and that you will heal their bodies in the name of Jesus, we ask. And, Lord, we just ask that you will continue to keep us in your loving care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Reading is starting at verse 16. Read as thus. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy which temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, 
He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Amen. You're on mute, Bishop. You're on mute, Pastor. Boy, y'all missed all of that good stuff. I can't even remember <laughs> it now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As we look at our first outline tonight of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, verses 16 and verse 17 in context, it talks about the church as a temple. As we um, reached out last week, we closed out, loading you up, talking about the church building. Now we're talking about the church as a temple. It's not talking about brick and mortar, not talking about foundation and shingles and steeples and baptisms, uh, but it's talking about we as the people of God, we are the temple, we are the true church. So in actuality, on Sunday mornings, we don't go to church. We uh, we bring the church to the building. All right. Paul said, you are the temple. Ye are the temple of God. Or will later in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20, speak as individual Christians being temple. Here, his emphasis is on the church as a whole, though it has application to individuals. When Paul calls the church a temple, don't think he is using a picture. The physical temple was the picture. God's dwelling in us is the reality. He said, you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. What makes the church a temple? The spirit of God dwells in you. The ancient Greek word used for temple is naos, N-A-O-S. And it refers to the actual sanctuary, the place of the deities dwelling, the place of God's dwelling, in contrast to the broader word harion, which is the temple area in general, and Hiram is H-I-E-R-O-N. It says, if anyone defile, defiles the temple of God, if you defile the church, God would destroy you. God's temple, his church is holy, and it matters to how we treat his holy temple. And so in context of verses 18 through 20, Deacon Walker, um, uh, it outlines to us how to glorify God in our temple. Share with us how do we glorify God in our temple and what we what we are to pursue in glorifying him. Well, first thing he says, if anyone among you seems to be wise. So Paul is being a little sarcastic here. Of course, the Corinthians considered themselves wise in this age. That was one of their problems, their love of worldly wisdom. It says, uh, let him become a fool that he may become wise. So what is one to do if they are wise in this age? If they are wise according to a human me measure of wisdom, they are to become a fool that may become wise. So Paul asked them to renounce all worldly wisdom and hu all humanism, that man-centered philosophy, even if it means being called a fool. So if one is not willing to be considered a fool by those who value only human wisdom, they will never be able to truly become wise. Okay, so now the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. God has evaluated the wisdom of this world and he considers it foolishness, craftiness, and futile. Will we agree with God's evaluation or not? 
Amen. Uh, closing out Romans, um, not Romans, but First Corinthians chapter verses twenty-one, verse, uh, twenty-three. It talks about glorify God by seeing His right perspective. Glorify God by seeing His servants in the right perspective. In order to glorify God in your temple, um, we have to pursue real wisdom. Real wisdom is not the philosophy of man. When you think about it, uh, um, in the Greek or Roman world, um, it was filled with philosophers and Plato, Socrates, Aristotle's, uh, and they wooed and they wowed uh, the minds of the crowds uh, as they journeyed to and fro um, discussing the affairs of the day, be they political, family, religious. Uh, they had very robust vocabularies. They were very learned men, but they were just talking just to be talking to entertain but they were not seeking to empower people to have a connection with God because in Rome, Greek or Roman culture, they practiced polytheism. They believed that there was a God for everything. Uh, they had a temple, they had a shrine for every type of God that they believed in. And so Paul is uh, taking us on a journey. He is volleying back and forth talking about the wisdom of God in, in relation to the wisdom of, of man. He's, uh, he's talking about how to honor God or how to glorify God in the right way and also how to have the right decorum of respect and honor for the servants of God who are teaching, preaching, evangelizing, witnessing, and discipling uh, the world uh, for Christ. And so when it comes to the context of the servants of God who lead the people to God, Paul said that we should not boast in man. We should not try to put one man over another man, uh, one man under another man, or female versus a male, male versus a female, young versus old. He said we should have no glory in men. And he said, how prone we are to glory in men. We're more excited about being with influential and famous people of this world than about being with God. We value the gifts and honors of men more than the gifts and honors that God gives. How we need to hear, let no one glory in men. Why does he say, let no one Glory in men, Deacon Walker. It says, for, for all things are yours. So to say I am of Paul or I am of Apollos is to have a view that is too narrow, too constricted. Both Paul and Apollos belong to you. The whole universe is yours in Christ. So why even, I mean, why? Because even death is ours. It is our servant, not our master. Death may be to us as the angel who touched Peter in Acts 12, causing his chains to fall off and leading him through a gate that opens by itself into real freedom. So all are yours. This is Christian liberty and you are Christ. This is Christian responsibility. Yeah. That concludes 1 Corinthians chapter 3. As we let our fingers do the walking over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, received a gift from a pastor, a um, book by Dr. Charles Swindale, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Living Insights. Um, and it says that um, the life application of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 major theme is building up or tearing down. It says, clearly God takes his spiritual building project, the church, very seriously. 
so seriously, in fact, that Paul warns of dire consequences if anyone contributes to its destruction rather than its construction, according to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 17. He says, but what about us? Do we care enough about the growth of fellow believers in our local churches to seriously evaluate our own contributions to its ministry? I'm not talking about financial contribution, though that's certainly important. I'm talking about the things Paul was writing about under the power of the Holy Spirit, building up the body of Christ through quality character and service toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. Our building projects will one day be inspected by eyes that can see into every nook and cranny, cracking crevice, closet and attic of our lives. So we should resist taking shortcuts in the local church ministry set before us. We should follow God's blueprint exactly, building our lives on the foundation of with materials that will withstand the blaze of his coming glory. Surely 1 Corinthians 3 should cause us to ask practical questions related to the quality of materials we're using in spiritual construction of our own local churches. Are we building up or tearing down? To help us ponder, um, let's ask ourselves a few probing questions. Don't rush through them. Ask them seriously and ask, answer them honestly. There are five questions. Am I building up my fellow believers in my local church with quality bricks of humility, contentment, patience, perseverance, love, and integrity? Or am I contributing poor quality works in my church like pride, ambition, impatience, weakness, bitterness, or disharmony? Am I neglecting ministry opportunities that could be building up my local church members? What are, they, what are they? How soon can I get involved? Number four, have I failed to see my local church with the same love and priority that God sees it as his temple? 1 Corinthians 3.16. What things in my life have I been consistently placing ahead of God's church? Question number five. Am I truly giving my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength to the Lord's service? On what things am I focusing my greatest affections and attention? I know with um, me just getting this book and you all just getting those questions, we wouldn't have the, uh, the breadth or the depth of time to go through it, but I will um, make a copy of these and make these available for you to walk through to ponder the pontificate so that you can uh, request and the text and the chapter in context and re and question how to make life application that we're not just checking the box that we went through the book, but we'll make sure that the book stuck with us. And so as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter four, 1 Corinthians chapter four, I'm going to look at the first five verses, first five verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It has an overall theme. Are you glorified without us? Are you glorified without us? So, Sister Buddha, if you would read those first five verses, please. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is very, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring 
to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Amen. Amen. So, so as we go into 1 Corinthians chapter 4, um, Charles Swindoll says, Paul is writing this chapter to correct the ills and immorality that is going on, correcting the ills and the immorality. He starts this in chapter 4, and it continues all the way to verse 20 of chapter 6 correcting ills and immorality. 1 Corinthians 4 uh, continues the theme, how to regard God's servant. A, how the Corinthians should consider Paul and the apostles. Servants and stewards, according to verse 1 and verse 2, let a man consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. He has called us to, um, moreover, it is required that stewards be found faithful. He said, let a man so consider us. Paul asked that he and the other apostles uh, and his, uh, who were his contemporaries in biblical antiquity, and even those of us who served the Lord's people and served the Lord's table that we should be considered and looked upon and regarded as servants. Paul had a, a real problem. He had a, a bone to pick with the Corinthians. They tend to look down on him and not respect his apostolic authority. In carefully chosen words, Paul will show the Corinthians how to have a proper regard not too exalted and not too low of himself and other faith leaders. Even so today, we must respect our faith leaders properly. If we, if we regard them too high, it is viewed as idolatry. And if we regard them too low, it is viewed as rebellion. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So consider us as servants of Christ. There are several different words in the language of the New Testament to describe a servant. Here, Paul uses the word hyperitis, hyperitis, which describes a subordinate servant functioning as a free man. It describes a subordinate servant functioning as a free man. Hyperetas, H-Y-P-E-R-E-T-A-S, H-Y-P-E-R-E-T-A-S. And so uh, this word means that although you are a servant, you are functioning as a free man. So you are a servant by your own free will. You are not uh, forced into slavery. You're not forced into slavery. God did not put a yoke on your neck and force you into this. Uh, he put it before you and gave you a chance to um, accept and or reject uh, being a servant of, of his uh, willingly. He does not use the more common New Testament word for servant, which is doulos, doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. And doulos uh, is what refers and what is designated to the common slave, is what's uh, designated to a common uh, slave. Uh, for a um, uh, recall, um, question was asked, will you also give the name for idolatry? 
the um, I gave the the scripture reference from First Samuel chapter fifteen verse twenty three. First Samuel fifteen twenty three. Uh, says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Paul said, even so today, we must respect our faith leaders properly. If we regard them too high, it is viewed as idolatry. And if we regard them too low, it is viewed as rebellion. And that is where the cross reference of First Samuel 15, 23, uh, where it was declared that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And so the, the dynamic is that idolatry is not just thinking about man too high, but is also thinking about God too low. Uh, you cannot think enough of God pulling him down from the apex, the zenith, and the synchronized position of being Lord in your life. And it can be seen as idolatry because according to Matthew 6.33, in all of the wisdom and history writings of the, of the Old Testament, God is supposed to be first. If we get God in place, God makes everything else that is needed and necessary for our good to uh, to be in uh, in place. Uh, so, when it comes to a practical sense, uh, what did Trap uh, say about hyperetus, the the free willing, the the freely surrendering, submissive servant? Deacon Walker. They said the word hyperetus literally means an under roar, roar, in the sense that someone is a roar on a big galley ship with those big oars and paddles and stuff. So though it is not the most lowly word for a servant, it is certainly not a prestigious position. Under roars serve Christ the master pilot, helping forward the ship of the church toward the heaven of heaven. Now, Morgan describes this under roar, roar, as one who acts under direction and asks no questions, one who does the thing he is appointed to do without hesitation, and one who reports only to the one who is over him. And stewards, that we're supposed to be that, and stewards. In addition to being a servant, Paul asked to be considered as a steward who was the manager of a household. So in relation to the master of the house, the steward was a slave. But in relation to the other slaves, the steward was a master. So the steward was the master's deputy in regulating the concerns of the family, providing food for the household, seeing it served out at proper times and seasons and in proper quantities. He received all the cash, expended what was necessary for the support of the family and kept exact accounts for which he was obliged at certain time to lay before the master. And stewards, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Excuse me. And so, um, Paul said that uh, as servants and stewards, that we are stewards of the mysteries of God. So, as a steward, steward means manager. What the the relevant question is? What did Paul and the other apostles manage in the household of God? Among other things, they were stewards of the mysteries of God. They managed, uh, and when I say managed in this scripture, in, a, in the sense of preserving and protecting. Uh, and they dispensed because they were the distributors of the truth of God's word, the truth of God's uh, voice. 
and that the Bible in context is, uh, is information. But when the Bible is being preached uh, or you're in a teach moment, then the, the logos becomes the rima. The written word becomes the spoken word and the information uh, is uh, turned into life application uh, simply because of revelation uh, that God gives the servants, gives the stewards as they lay before God in the early church. They realized that the mysteries of God, the secrets of God that he wanted to reveal to his uh, his his organism, the church, was so important that um, they appointed uh, the first deacons in Acts chapter 6 because it was so much time being spent on the social need of the people and making sure that all of the human needs were being met as the church <clears throat> began to become more diverse that it was taking so much time and attention from the apostles uh, laying before God in prayer and preparation that the uh, the spiritual office of the deacon or the diaconos was birthed in the church in order to help uh, meet the needs in order, uh, as they say, that in the church, uh, there are two tables. There are two tables and the deacons were, ministry was birthed to help serve, serve the tables. Uh, and that's the Lord's table and that's the, the church table. Amen, the Lord's table, we just had first Sunday. And so what do we have on the Lord's table? Communion. Communion. And after, we yeah. after we receive communion, uh, we put the church table out. And what do we receive for the church? The offering. The offering, yes, yes. So. So the Lord's table is what the Lord gave us. The church table is what we give the church in order to sustain the work of, of the Lord. And so whenever Paul would hear criticism of his style or manner, he could simply ask one question. What's that one question, Deacon Mark? Did I give you the truth? Okay, so whether the chicken is fried, baked, barbecued, <laughs> or burned up, at the end of the day, it's still chicken. <laughs> it's and so, chicken. and so, and so, Paul said plainly and clearly, what we really are—we're stewards and we're managers of the truth. And as a good steward, and as uh, as a um, uh, recipient of the stewardship, what was important is that she was getting the truth. And, and, and Paul said this because the most important requirement of a servant or a steward of God is that one be found faithful. For stewards, the important thing was faithfulness. I think I said last week that you need to be fat. Capital F period, capital A period, capital T period. That means you must be faithful, you must be available, and you must be teachable. I don't care whether you call yourself the Pope, the Bishop, the Reverend, the Potentate, uh, uh, Reverend Deacon, Dr. Doug, somebody has to be pouring into you. You have to have accountability and responsibility. Uh, I know if I don't call my pastor, uh, uh, my phone get to blowing up. Uh, he'll call everybody who know me. Have y'all? And he'll make sure that somebody has heard from me that uh, that's in the circle of accountability. Uh, that don't that don't mean because you can never get to one person all the time uh, when you're when you are being served and mentored by leaders. Then uh, like Jesus had an inner circle, you have to have an inner circle of people who hold you accountable. And sometimes you have to have uh, different people who hold you accountable for different areas of your life because God did not put all of the answers in one person because one person may be good at family, 
but they're not good at money. So, so you don't want them trying to tell you about them about your money when you already know that they're not good at what? Money. At money. Yeah. Uh, somebody may be good at studying and reading and getting information, but they struggle with prayer. And so you wouldn't want you wouldn't want a person who struggle with prayer to be your prayer coach. Huh? You, you want them to work with you in the area where God has gifted them to, to specialize. So Paul was saying they had to be efficient managers of the master's resources. And, and the, the thing to keep in mind is a steward never owned the property or the resource that he dealt with, he or she dealt with. They simply managed it for their master and they had to manage it faithfully. They had to manage it faithfully. And so um, why was it so important? Uh, let me see how to ask this thing, Walker. Um, Who did, who did Paul and all servants of his day, all time up to today and into and until the end of time, as servants and stewards of God resources, who are we accountable to? Who do we have to give answer to? To God. Yes, yeah, so and being God's servants, we answer only to him. Yes. Amen. So he said, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Paul insists that their low estimation of him really mattered little. It is what God judges that is important. Paul said, he who judges me is the Lord. All right. So should, should, should we throw that away as history uh, in the 21st century, or how should we approach that in the 21st century? Well, uh, it's, if, if we can or should, every Christian today have the same attitude. Should we have no or little regard for what other Christians think about us and just say, he who judges me is the Lord? We can only say this in the full sense that Paul means it if we are apostles. If the, if the Corinthians claimed that Paul could not judge them and that they would simply wait for God's judgment, Paul would remind them that he is a father to them and has the right to correct their behavior. In fact, I do not even judge myself. Even our estimation of ourselves is usually wrong. We are almost always too hard or too easy on ourselves. So Paul recognizes this and so will suspend judgment even upon himself. In the end, he who judges me is the Lord. For I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. So Paul also recognized that he does not stand in a perfect state of justification or innocence just because his conscience was clear. Now, Paul knew that his righteousness came from Jesus, not from his own personal life, even though he had a godly walk. So therefore, he said, judge nothing before the time. It is as if Paul were saying, you Corinthians act like judges at athletic events qualified to give the trophy and to send others away as losers. But Jesus is the only judge, and you are judging before the events are even over. So who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of men's hearts? When Jesus judges, it will be according to the motives of the heart, not only the outward action, this is another reason why human judgment is often wrong and why Paul feels free to disregard the harsh judgment of the Corinthian Christians towards him. Each one 
Each one's praise will come from God. That means that Paul knew he had little praise from the Corinthian Christians, but that did not concern him. He knew there was a day coming when our praise will come from God, not from man. Amen. Amen. Paul did his greatest work at Corinth. And the Corinthians thought the more Paul did, the less they should honor and uh, dear him for God assigning him uh, to reach them with the gospel. So in the minutes we have left, we're going to look at verse 6. Go to verse 6, let's read it up. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Amen. 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 In that, in that one verse, all loaded the gun of purpose, uh, uh, perfection, and uh, gave the uh, Corinthian church uh, what is described by most commentators as a sarcastic rebuke for their Corinthian pride. A sarcastic rebuke of their Corinthian pride. So the broader application, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, is I have figuratively transferred in the first few verses of this chapter, Paul spoke of the apostles being servants and stewards. He does not mean this in literal way, but in a figurative way. So the Corinthian Christians would learn a more proper way to see the apostles. He says that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Paul hopes his writing will help the Corinthian Christians learn to keep their thinking biblical and not to use standards beyond the word of God to judge him or to judge any of the other apostles uh, who were serving, serving them. And so, was that just true in Paul's day, Deacon Walker? Well, no. Um, many people today evaluate a pastor or a minister on unbiblical standards. They, they judge him on his humor, his entertainment value, his appearance, or his skill at marketing and sales. But this is to think beyond what is written in the sense Paul means it here. In a broader sense, it is an important lesson not to think beyond what is written. We must take our every cue from Scripture. It is used, it is used to be that something was considered biblical, or it used to be that something was considered biblical if it came from the Bible. Today, people say things are biblical if they can't find a verse which specifically condemns it. This is to think beyond what is written so that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Now that is as when Corinthian Christians used unbiblical standards to judge the apostles, they could easily like one and hate another based on bad standards. But if they learned to not think beyond what is written, they wouldn't proudly take sides behind certain apostles as 1 Christians 3 and 4 says they did. Amen. Amen. So God want us to be true to the book, be true to the information and revelation of his word, we pray something God has said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 1 Corinthians chapter 4 has blessed you, has challenged you, has, has encouraged you um, in your heart and in your mind. And as we 
uh, make ready tonight to um, uh, close out for tonight. Uh, if you look in the chat, uh, if you're with us on the Zoom, if you look in the chat, um, there are several events coming up um, from our uh, New Era District uh, Youth um, Family Fun Day that will be hosted this weekend. Um, we also have on the calendar a um, SALT event. Um, need uh, registration uh, to make sure we have sufficient registration to push this forward. The, um, the SALT event is for, it's an entire family event that will launch our Courageous Conversation Series. And we will follow it up with a discussion, a uh, group panel discussion afterwards. So if you plan on coming, you have not had time to register, if you uh, look in the chat uh, for the registration link, or, uh, scroll back up to the poster and use the QR code to register. And uh, once we get the registration uh, identification um, head count, um, uh, tomorrow evening, then we'll be letting you know on Friday um, the next steps on that event. Uh, on Friday morning, we have a ongoing celebration for Charlie Dixon visitation at 10 o'clock a.m. and the service at 12 p.m. and the appointment the cemetery at 2 p.m. So, um, board secretary and our kingdom care team, we have the information needed to walk with that family during this time of all so would connect connect with our with your ministry leader our board secretary or the human care team thanks and sister Nina, to see what is needed of your ministry to the setup team um, gave confirmation that they have already um, transfer transformed the sanctuary to be ready for the family. So uh, the elite funeral home will probably arrive about 9.30. That's their normal time, 30 minutes before the visitation. So get, make sure that our deacons and elders, and his makers have that, that time uh, locked in. So um, the following weekend, we have our Hope Regional Conference and our state Outreach conference uh, registration links are in the chat. A few are in the chat. So we need 25 people to sign up for Friday night for the outreach conference. 25 to sign up for Saturday. Uh, each ministry for the Hope Regional Conference that we are hosting in the Family Life Center. Um, each ministry is asked to have at least two members of their ministries registered, and you also have the opportunity as other vendors will be talking about health and wellness um, in four different areas uh, and have resources for other areas of health and wellness education and supplies and samples. Uh, you will be able to um, have uh, uh, your ministry table set up to share with the local community and those who are traveling abroad, uh, spiritual wellness opportunities that your ministry can provide and how to uh, evangelize with them, engage them, and equip them for kingdom empowerment. And so if you have a desire for your ministry to be represented with a table, <clears throat> please follow the process. Uh, reach out to Sister Virgie Hickman or any member of the health and wellness ministry. Um, and they have sent out letters Forwarded letters that have QR codes uh, in them or hyperlinks uh, in them for you to be able to sign your, your ministry up. And in the next day or two this evening, get the movie mine in the hyperlink as well as the QR code. Tomorrow you will get the hope. Saturday you will get the, um, uh, the outreach and um, uh, I just saw registrations come in the last Saturday and last weekend of this month. 
as we climax 46 years of ministry, we have a multi-generational sneaker ball. Uh, our swag youth and young adult ministry will coordinate that uh, from four to seven on April the 27th. We need you to register. The reason registration is important is so that we can make sure that we have adequate staffing, adequate um, uh, belly, belly treats so that we can leave um, well, having had fun, having had fellowship, and having had good food, good fun, and good fellowship. And so we ask you, please, ma'am, please uh, make ready for that. And uh, the morning before that, we will have a celebration of life service for the mother of our music director, Brother Thomas Griffin. So I can do you know, for him as he travels this weekend. His best friend uh, lost his mother as well. So he has to travel to St. Louis this weekend for that home celebration. So he will be leaving tomorrow for that Friday funeral. So we in prayer for him and his family as they uh, navigate these, these waters. Um, are there any other prayer focuses that uh, you know, Deacon Walker? Uh, no, not, uh, I don't have anything, thank you. Okay, and so this this Saturday, uh, we thank our Kingdom Marketplace um, ministry for blessing the community this week with uh, uh, great supplies of food. Uh, uh, I, I gave y'all the warning uh, Sunday to get your 30 to 90 day supply of food. Within 24 hours, we had a company to call us and say, we got 3,000 pounds of bacon we want to bless y'all with. So, so I hope you came and got your bacon. Man, amen. So this Saturday, we will have our mobile pantry. Yes, you will please, ma'am, please, sir, I got your eyes, got your teas. Come and help us serve the uh, community. Uh, on Sunday morning, this Sunday morning, uh, the new era will have their early morning uh, layman's worship service. Their early morning worship service will be uh, will be held at our um, um, Congress President's Church, which is Holy Hill. Missionary Baptist Church located at 203 Northwest 16th Street in Blue Springs, Missouri. The host pastor is President Don Graves. Uh, and that is a early morning service for the layman uh, men ministry of a local district. Uh, once a month, they'll go around to different churches to have uh, that 6 a.m. early bird service. Well, what we used to call sunrise service. And so time has changed and it's not those cold, cold mornings of the winter. So those of you who want to go on fellowship and worship with the layman, we invite you to do so at this time. Um, as you close, up, close us out in prayer, I'm going to get this frog All back right. out of my throat. <laughs> Let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now as humbly as we know how, giving you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for allowing us to study your word and to learn your word right now, Lord, and that we will take what we've heard today and apply it in our daily lives. Lord, we ask that you would bless all those that are on the call right now, that you will touch each and every one of our members, that you will bless the congregation of Second Missionary Baptist Church, that you will bless all the Christian followers of your word, Lord, worldwide right now, Lord. We ask that you will be with us, see us through this night, and wake us up ready for another great and glorious day. We ask these blessings in your darling son Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. amen. You on mute, Bishop. Yeah, you God bless y'all. Y'all have a good night. <laughs> Love, you <laughs> Love you guys. Excellent lesson. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.